This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. It is the noon hour on Thursday, folks. Ted Ralston here in downtown Honolulu, overlooking uh, Waikiki right now, as a matter of fact, on our show, Where the Drone Leads, where we bring to our public news and information that's uh, relevant and uh, exciting about the emerging world of drones. And today we have joining us uh, from Washington, D.C., uh, far across the uh, Pacific and then the whole continent, we have Mark McKinnon of LeClaire Ryan LLC. Uh, Mark is a partner in the organization and the head of the Unmanned Air Systems Practices at LeClaire Ryan, which obviously is a purveyor of legal services. Mark, thanks for jo joining the show today. Great to be here. Great, there you are. Next, next time we'll get you here in your Aloha shirt and uh, sitting in the actual studio here as opposed to uh, giving your time across the way. By the way, this is Mark's first 30 non-billable minutes of the day. Uh, here at the end of the day and <laughs> thanks for sticking around uh, past the uh, the hour and hanging out with us mark but I, first of all i think a thanks to all of you in the legal profession who take the time to break down these really complex issues of uh, legislation and emerging legislation and the contrariness of it uh, so we can all understand it we in the business of uas whatever that may be need a, a, a clear and, under, and simple way to, under, uh, to understand it you guys have done that in particular, the webinar your company ran last week, which uh, exposed in 37 slides the result of 1,400 pages of the recently authorized uh, reauthorization of the FAA for the next five years. And, and there's a significant new information in there about UAS and drones, and we're really appreciative of you bringing that forward to us. So tell us a little bit about your company, and then Mark, how you got into the unmanned air systems practices uh, in that company. Well, the Lacroix Ryan is actually a, uh, a large nationwide law firm. We have offices all over the United States. It's a full-service law firm. You know, every type of law imaginable, you know, white-collar crime, civil actions, government contracts, a little bit of everything. Um, I'm part of the aviation practice, and I've been practicing aviation law for about 25, actually over 25 years now. Um, and yeah, how I got into unmanned aircraft systems is, I guess, kind of interesting because I started my career primarily dealing with manned aircraft accidents, particularly the big commercial air disasters. And uh, going through the late 80s and the 90s and even the really early 2000s, there was plenty of work to do because there were lots of, lots of plane crashes. But as commercial aviation has become safer and safer over the years, there's less and less accident work to do. So my practice kind of evolved and I do a lot more FAA regulatory and compliance work, NTSB issues, things like that. And then over the past probably about five or six years, uh, as the unmanned aircraft systems uh, became, you know, there were more commercial opportunities involved, uh, and the FAA took a, a greater legal interest in it. Obviously, there was a lot more work, legal work, that needed to be done in unmanned aircraft. So I've kind of transitioned and opened up that whole new field now. But it's just an outgrowth of the fact that I've been doing aviation law for, for so long. What's, what's most interesting, interesting is, as you said, the FAA taking the actions it's taking and the interest it's taking, uh, of course, driven by Congress in many respects, uh, but paying attention to UAS in a way none of us could ever have imagined. I, I can remember three or four years ago where the industry was complaining all the time to the FAA, I mean, you guys aren't making fast enough, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. Suddenly, 10, suddenly 333 hit the street. Not two years later, 107 hit the street. Now we have the Next reauthorization with five years of continued development of uh, UAS integration. It's just in an FAA we've never seen before. This is an incredible yeah. growth of, of uh, regulatory material, but behind it is the thinking and the engineering and the science and the economics of making this a successful business. So I think we all put our hats off, take our hats off to the FAA for the motions they made. And uh, I think we can thank our common friend Jim Williams for having been a lot, having a lot to do with that uh, back in the days uh, some time ago. Anyway, uh, what, what's most in, intriguing is the, the key issues that are coming forward in this Reauthorization Act dealing with uh, UAS. I made a list from our webinar a couple of days ago, your webinar. First of all, we have the, uh, uh, finally a definition of a community-based organization and a way to capture institutional knowledge coming out of the hobbyists and recreation people to not lose that but capitalize on that going forward. I thought that was a significant uh, highlight. I thought uh, pulling all the UAS into regulations, be they 10,000-pound uh, 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 surveillance aircraft or 
two and a half pound small aircraft or half pound uh, uh, recreational toys are all going to be considered uh, part of the airspace integration at some point in time, and we're going to see how the FAA works that out. Intriguing in particular was the GAO requirement to go generate a report after studying something on how low altitude airspace integration might actually belong or be heavily directed by local uh, civil agencies as opposed to fall under the FAA. Uh, and of course the test sites being extended to 2023 and being able to take in federal money uh, to me as a, one of our test site directors, I think that's really important and interesting to us. Remote ID and tracking and some first level of defense uh, for infrastructure and airports against UAS and a continued push on airspace integration that uh, UPP, IPP, the various initiatives that FAA has got going have to be now codified and made part of the, the future set of regulations. So absolutely hats off to whoever wrote that and uh, whoever coordinated it and, uh, and, and to you and the others who've been able to understand it and pass it to us who never would have any, uh, uh, the foggiest idea of what's going on behind the scenes. So tell us a little bit if you can, how did this particular set of very wise guidances for the FAA to act upon, how did that get created? How does this Reauthorization Act get created? What influences it? Well, it, it, it's kind of a, a it, it's like the joke about uh, making sausage and nobody, acts, everybody likes sausage but nobody wants to see it made. But legislation is obviously a lot like that. Um, and this bill in particular has a lot of hallmarks of, of sausage making because what happened was you know, the, the, the last reauthorization was in 2012, and these reauthorizations are good for five years. Um, and we are, we were in the six and a half year, six and a half year of the five year authorization because what happened was uh, when the five years was up in 2017, they had a very detailed bill that had a lot of this stuff in it. It didn't have quite as much in it, but it had a lot of this stuff in it. But one of the things that the House has been pushing for a long time, the House of Representatives, uh, has been the commercialization, or no, the, but technically it's the privatization, of the air traffic control system. And I, I shouldn't have actually said commercialization because the, the system that they want to set up is actually it's a nonprofit. Um, and it's actually, a lot of people don't know that there are a lot of foreign countries where the air traffic control system is actually run by nonprofits, they're not run by the government. There's a big example of that. Um, I said the House of Representatives, particularly um, uh, the chairman of the committee, uh, this has been a big issue for him. People in the Senate did not like it, and President Obama was strongly against it. So there was like, there was a, a competing bills between the, the House and the Senate, and they couldn't work out these issues, and so at the last minute they passed a short-term extension for six months, and then that got extended to another six months, and that got extended to another six months because nobody could agree. And then finally, um, I think it was in April of this year, the House of Representatives decided that there wasn't going to be any common ground, so they just dropped that requirement entirely. And so they went ahead and they promptly passed a bill, and then it sat in the Senate from April all the way through basically the first week in October. Um, and the problem was, once it got into the Senate, there were provisions that people had put in there that didn't have anything to do with aviation, had to do with rules about whether or not states could regulate the, t the uh, duty hours of long-haul interstate trucking. And nobody would budge on that, and that resulted in a couple of short-term extensions. Um, and then finally, at the last minute, uh, they, they caved on that, and they pulled it out, and then they were able to put it together. But it was just, it was a long and torturous project that, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it takes a long time and a lot of lobbyists involved, but, uh, uh, lost my screen, <laughs> uh, a lot of lobbyists involved, but ultimately we got, we got the bill we have. Well, that's great, but uh, once again, the content in it is pretty good. You, know, you talked about the uh, privatization having gone away, which then opened the door to the success of the, of the bill going through, but still, somebody had to create the content. Somebody had to figure out that we we're going to deal with, uh, for example, the test sites. Someone had to figure out we're going to do with uh, deal with uh, remote ID and tracking. So there had to be well-thought, well-considered, well-structured content that went into this that people that was, had to be formatted in such a way people could understand it and then see the value and, and vote on it. So. Uh, as an example, if I, as a, just an individual out in the far corners of the world here, had an idea, how would I get my idea baked into the next version of this uh, reauthorization in 2022? Well, that's a difficult, 
uh, question because uh, you, obviously the best place to start is with either your congressman or the, your, your senator. And if they actually happen to be on the relevant committee, that's a big help because they're the ones who are involved in the process. Um, uh, but a lot, of, a lot of the larger institutions, Google, Amazon, people like the Academy of Model Aeronautics, they all have lobbyists. And the lobbyists work very hard with the staff, all of them pushing their ideas. There's a lot of, you know, trading, a lot of, uh, and a lot of times say the staff will draft a regulation and they, they might not see the, some of the nuances of it. Then industry will come in or the FAA will come in and uh, they'll make comments and say, well, this needs to be changed or you don't understand this is the problem you're setting up and you need to fix it. Uh, so that's how a lot of that happens. Uh, the ability of an individual to, to directly influence it obviously is pretty limited, uh, but your ability to basically get in front of a congressman and get his attention and have you take him seriously. I can see some congressmen are better than others. Um, in addition, each of the uh, committees do have staff, the career staff who work on these issues, and they're actually pretty knowledgeable. Um, if you can contact some of the staff, sometimes they'll listen to what you have to say, particularly if you have a, something important to say. So that's that's primarily the, the best ways to get involved. Okay. I just wanted to uh, make a comment. We just, I don't know if you saw the uh, subtitle come up, but we, we labeled this episode uh, Leaping into the Future, uh, reacting to the, all the changes that are coming in the, the consolidation of thinking in the UAS domain. And we called it that, not quite fancifully, but relative to the speed and pace at which uh, regulatory material has been developed in the past on UAS, what we see here is truly leaping into the future because we're looking at basically setting the stage for beyond line of sight and a much improved waiver situation and, um, and, it, and true integration. So if you were to think about the elements that are affecting UAS in this reauthorization, uh, what do you, tell us what you think is gonna occur now, now that the FAA has been given this guidance, which is the reauthorization, now they've got to do something with it. In some cases, there's law changes. In some cases, there's probably interpretations. But there certainly is study, and there's uh, research and uh, work that has to be done behind the scenes before these instructions can be converted into regulations. So how does that all going to work? Yeah, well, what's going to happen, I think uh, there actually there are some rulemakings that are going on, and, and there have been some impediments to them. The big one was, I don't know if you remember, I guess it would over a year ago now, uh, there was uh, a lot of work that was done on the flight over people rule. And the flight over people rule, you know, the reason they started as the micro UAS rule and then they just converted that because they realized it wasn't going to be dealing with micro, it was going to be dealing with what are the rules for flying over large assemblies of people. And they did a lot of work on that. They, they had an ARC, an aviation rulemaking committee that Meta came up with some very good recommendations. The FAA had a draft rule. The draft rule went to uh, OIRA, which is one of the, is the entities at the White House, which reviews regulations, and they take comments from stakeholders and they take comments from other governmental agencies before the, the public basically gets to see it. And one of the big issues was uh, law enforcement chimed in at that point and said, we don't want you to come up with a rule for flying over people uh, because we think there are security issues with it. And the main one is, if right now, if there's a drone that's sighted over a mass assembly of people, we know it's not supposed to be there, and we can take action. With the rules that you're thinking about coming up with, which are performance-based, um, we won't be able to tell if we see a drone, is it a good drone, is it a bad drone, what, how do we gauge intent? And so they said, unless you come up with a way for remote identification of unmanned aircraft, we really don't want you to do this. And that's why it's been probably over, we're going to probably get close to two years now. Uh, where that then was completely taken off the table, and that component, that uh, remote identification component, has been one of the major holdbacks uh, of flight over people. And of course, remote identification also really is a, uh, an impediment to uh, beyond visual line of sight because unless you can, you know, remotely identify aircraft, it's difficult to coordinate aircraft in the airspace. Uh, so I think one of the things that this does, and we talked about, you know, you mentioned the. Um, uh, the um, community-based organizations and the changes to the hobbyist rules and the, the big impediment, one of the big impediments was, you know, the under Section 336 of the original 2012 Act, Con or FAA was prohibited from making any rules regarding model aircraft. Um, and the new revisions to that rule actually allow the FAA to set some design standards for hobby aircraft. 
Um, and as a result, that I think is going to open up the door for solutions because the FAA, uh, you know, if they're going to lock light over people, it's not just people under 107 who are going to potentially be flying over people. It's, it's hobbyists as well. They're going to want to try to do it. Um, and so, again, with, with the old rule of not being able to set any design standards for hobby aircraft, I think that was a big impediment. And so that's one of the big changes, I think, that uh, it's going to open that up, and that in turn is going to open up some of these other areas for, for uh, you know, moving forward on their rulemaking. Okay. Well, that, so you've kind of outlined the process of how the reauthorization formed up anyway, and you've now talked about how FAA will react to the instructions that's been given. When we get back from our first and our only one-minute break here, let's talk about the specific items that affect UAS and sort of at a look forward to what we might expect coming out of that in one minute. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I'm getting older. Do I need to worry about falling? Yes, you do. Each year, one in four people 65 and older will experience a fall, and many will be serious. The majority of falls happen at home, so remove things that could make you trip and install handrails to keep you steady. To learn more about the steps you can take to help prevent a fall, please talk to your doctor. You can also visit aarpfoundation.org or medicaremadeclear.com slash falls. This message was brought to you by United Healthcare and AARP Foundation. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. It is still Thursday noon hour, folks. Ted Ralston here in uh, Honolulu and joining us from far across the sea after the sun has gone down, I think, over there in Washington, D.C., we have Mark McKinnon of LeClaire Ryan LLC. Uh, Mark is a partner in the law firm and the head of the uh, unmanned air systems uh, uh, practice within that law firm. And the fact that you even have an unmanned systems division within the law firm, it'll, that alone says a lot about the emergence of this business, Mark. So we uh, thank you for taking your evening time and, and coming on with us here. We spoke uh, before the break about the, how the uh, Reauthorization Act was formed, what the content in it is, how the content uh, was sorted out by various uh, forces. And now we have, uh, if we can, talk about the specific items that are going to affect uh, UAS in the big picture and what we might see coming out of them and maybe even some idea of the timing. So if, if, you, if I can work with this list here, uh, we did, talked a little bit about before the break about the definition of a community-based organization and the way that pools inst institutional knowledge and goes forward. Uh, that just looks like it's positive all the way around. I don't see any downside or any, any confusion about that. Do you? No, I don't. Uh, one of the interesting things, I think, uh, coming out of it going forward, though, is the requirement that they all be if you're going to be certified as a community-based organization, and you're going to have uh, two things about it. Um, one is, so like the, really the only existing community-based organization I think that people recognize is the Academy of Model Aeronautics. I mean, the FAA, you know, they've kind of acknowledged in some of their publications that they would consider that to be a community-based organization even before these requirements came out. Um, but the, under the old Section 336, the, if you were a hobbyist and you were flying under the community-based organization's rules, community-based organization had basically its own safety code and that's what you had to follow. Now part of being defined as a community-based organization, it gives the FAA actually a say in how the community-based organization creates its safety code. So even though you know, you're working under the auspices of this private entity, the private entity is going to have to take input now from the FAA when it creates its safety code. Um, so I think that's actually one of, the, uh, one of the other big changes in it. And the other one is interesting is uh, the requirement that it be a nonprofit. Now Academy of Model Aeronautics is a nonprofit. But I think there was there questions. People thought that once the FAA created a system which could be recognized as one, you'd have for-profit businesses that would, you know, would declare themselves this. Uh, and that's basically foreclosed. You basically have to be a uh, you have to be a nonprofit, and you have to qualify under as a 501c3 under the Internal Revenue Code to do that. So, so it's going to be a little bit more limited. Well, the other thing I think about that is that now there's a compliance requirement that all users, all recreational people, educational people, whoever they may be operating under that uh, rubric are going to have to conform and, uh, and comply with whatever those terms are. And that is such a, 
uh, antithetical from where we've been all this time. And, um, you know, yeah. a guy gets the thing, takes it out of a box, looks at the FAA rules, it's way too complicated to understand, so it can't possibly apply to him, and he goes off and does his thing. So we've got a major educational uh, challenge ahead of us to get that story out. And I, I would say that that is going to be the, the operational factor most uh, important there. But pulling all unmanned air systems into, into the regulations means that those items that are considered uh, recreational today are going to have to be registered, they're going to have to be in, in this conformance domain. So we have, we might even have uh, technical requirements, I presume, in terms of the remote identification as such are not now going to apply to all these aircraft. So there's a, there's a technical change coming here as well. Yeah, I think so. In particular, the, uh, I, I think the, the FAA has more flexibility. It can, it'll, can define weight classes. So my guess is there probably will be, you know, for some of these like remote identification, there probably will be a, a lower limit, um, either of performance or weight, where that, uh, that performance, that, that won't be required. But I wouldn't, it wouldn't be surprised, wouldn't surprise me if, you know, something about the size of a DJI Phantom, you know, when used as a hobbyist would have some kind, whatever the remote, identif uh, remote identification technology is going to be, that there'll be a requirement that it be equipped with that. So I think anything that, or, you know, one pound, two pounds, certainly anything that has the capability of flying beyond visual line of sight, I think would, uh, would fall into that okay. category. So we're going to have some categorization into those things that are pretty much benign and those things that are not benign, and, and that'll be the discriminator. The, the GAO yeah. challenge to go figure out how to deal with low altitude integration and involve local agencies, uh, uh, we have that out here a lot. We have uh, the tourist industry, which people come and don't understand the rules, bring their drone and fly around Waikiki. We have the situation at the volcano. Uh, which ultimately had the uh, UAS operation had to be criminalized uh, operating inside the uh, TFR. So this would be quite a challenge for the GAO. There's so many different uh, geopolitical alignments here in, in the U.S. from very remote to very compact. So how do you think that's going to go in terms of their ability to get a handle on how to deal with low altitude integration? I think ultimately well, probably what they'll wind up doing is they'll do a survey of, of all of the existing state laws you know that are out there at this time uh, the big example is Nevada Nevada actually has uh, a, a law where you know alt uh, flights below a certain altitude are considered to be a trespass um, and that's uh, nobody has challenged that officially in the courts yet the FAA has made it clear that they think that is not that that is a violation of their prerogative under the federal preemption and, and federal control of the airspace uh, but they haven't done anything to take Nevada to court over it yet. Um, so I think what, what, what ultimately what Congress would like to do is to get an idea of what the needs are of the airspace as well. They want the GAO to determine if we cede from the ground to 100 feet or 200 feet or 300 feet to the state and local governments to let them have more of a say in where, where you can and can't fly. What impact will that have on some of these big, you know, potential commercial engines like uh, package delivery? Um, and those types of things that, that you know that they don't clearly don't want to be in a in a position of of choking that off by having a patchwork where every city and county's got its own airspace requirements for for unmanned aircraft. Um, but at the end of the day, there are, I think there are enough people who just don't want drones flying over their house that it will have, regardless of what the GAO finds and regardless of what Congress ultimately decides, it's something that the courts will have to decide. Because the courts will have to decide at what point as a property owner does your right to use your land mean that you have to be able to control at least some part of the airspace. And if you're deprived of that, at what point do you basically lose the ability to use your land the way you want to use it? Um, and I said, ultimately, I think that's going to be something that the Supreme Court will have to decide. And they, ha they haven't had a major case in that field since the 40s. So um, it's obviously it's an issue that's ripe to be decided, I think, at this point. It's just going to take a while to work its way through the system. You know, I like the fact that that's going to happen because uh, we have a lot of issues here in our legislature where bills come forward that, uh, that uh, don't understand the full limitations of the current laws don't understand the capabilities of drones. We have a kind of a complex situation where uh, bills come forward that are hard to understand and, and as a result none of them, I don't think any of them in our state in the last five years have been executed. And, but this, this uh, summary of uh, national perspectives that GAO is going to create I think will go a long way towards providing a standard that our legislature can look at in terms of dealing with its means of handling privacy, for example, or, or uh, trespass. 
Uh, the test sites, most interesting to me, test sites and the extension of them and the way federal funds can get into the test sites. What, what do you think about that? Or what do you see coming forward in that regard? Yeah, I think that's a big deal because originally it was one of those things where FAA didn't really want the test sites. Um, and the test sites were kind of seen as a solution in search of a problem that as far as the FAA was concerned, they had it up on their plate. They didn't really want to be, you know, dealing uh, – dealing with a mandate that didn't have money associated with it. So, they, I mean, they, they had no funding to do it, but they were told they had to coordinate it with them. And uh, they said, I, I think, certainly before the test sites were up and running, there was a lot of resistance at FAA. And I think definitely over time that's completely changed. And, uh, I mean, a lot of the, the progress that's been made in things like UTM um, and experimental work on package delivery, uh, I mean, none of that could have been gotten. We, we couldn't be where we are today without the test sites because, the FAA has basically empowered the test sites to do things that you couldn't do if you were just a commercial operator and you wanted to fly over your own property or in some part of the airspace that uh, the FAA hasn't, you know, agreed to work hand in hand with, with the test sites. And I said, I, I, think, I think the fact that uh, the Congress has agreed to extend the life of the test sites and then actually to put money on it, uh, I think that's a very good uh, harbinger for the future because there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and there has to be places where it can be done. And, and the, uh, the means by which funding, federal funding can flow to the test sites, uh, that's going to be, I would presume again, congressional delegation influence to go ahead and make that happen. Is that a reasonable yeah. assumption? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and to a certain extent, I mean, that's part of, part of the problem is since the test sites didn't have any money, you know, they had to look to outside sources for money and they've been very good at that. But again, it's, you know, so that cuts out certain people who simply can't you know, the test site can't give its services away for free in a lot of circumstances, and you know, there are, startups don't always necessarily have the money to be able to, you know, to come up with the funds to, to try and do some of the work. Again, particularly early on when the test sites were first gearing up and money was short everywhere. Well, it's still short. I can tell you that from our perspective here as uh, running one of the test ranges, but uh, it's good to see this, this change coming. Uh, we do have just a few more minutes here. Uh, the remote ID and tracking, that's pretty straightforward. Airspace integration, that's sort of like the... Uh, the culmination of all this into uh, into something that is integratable. Uh, most interesting, uh, I take the perspective that uh, we need some good mathematical understanding of complex systems that interact and such, and uh, I think there's an academic role here in the integration uh, element. What's your thoughts on that in our last declining minute here, Mark? Oh, I think that's definitely true. I mean, I think it's uh, uh, the, the UTM issue and how unmanned traffic management is going to fit into the into the airspace, uh, I think, is probably the ultimate challenge, uh, because the FAA has made it clear that they they have a lot of entrenched users of the airspace, all the demand aircraft, all the commercial operators and private operators, and they were not going to reorder the airspace just to accommodate unmanned aircraft. So I think you know trying to do the the work where unmanned aircraft can fit seamlessly into the existing structure, uh, you know, that's, that's where the future is. If, if that can't be done, then the, it simply can't be integrated into the airspace. Um, and I think really the research universities and NASA and organizations like that, uh, you know, the private industry can't really do a lot of that on their own without the cooperation of, of you know, these, you know, reservoirs of knowledge. Well, we certainly salute the FAA for the IPP program and then the UPP, which followed it, and things we'll hear of in the future that are going to extend beyond that, and we hope to be part of that. And uh, Mark McKinnon, I want to thank you very much, uh, first, for being on the show, and secondly, for the work you've done to bring these items out to the public in general through the webinars and such you, you uh, promote. So once again, uh, how do folks get a hold of you at uh, LeClaire Ryan if they want to? Uh, the best way is my email, which is Mark dot McKinnon, it's M-A-R-K dot M-C-K-I-N-N-O-N -N -N, at LeClaireRyan.com, which is L-E-C-L-A-I-R-R-Y-A-N dot com. Okay, and okay. we thank you very much for being on. And uh, we'll get you on real time here in, in, in Hawaii next time you're out here, or maybe again Great. by Skype. So thanks a lot, Mark, and we'll see you all in two weeks, folks.